this morning between two different interpretations of the fundamental probability measure that we use in statistical mechanics. One as a typicality measure and the other as a human probability law. And uh, maybe I can uh, use the opportunity to just advertise uh, a paper I've been uh, working on. So this would be the short URL of the most current draft. I'm happy to get uh, comments or feedback on that if you have time and interest to read it. So I'm obviously coming down more on the uh, typicality side. And um, I want to start maybe not, not so much with a defense of typicality, but with a critique of the metaculous and the human account. Very often, if you um, ask a human to explain quickly his or her view of probability, you get a very uh, nice and compelling story, maybe about you know you have a five-minute audience with God, and you ask them to tell you something uh, simple and informative about coin tosses, and telling you um, every single outcome of every single. Um, coin flip in the first world would obviously be too complicated and telling you, well, it can be either heads or tails, it wouldn't give you any information. So God tells you, well, the probability of heads or tails is one half, and he means that, well, there are very many coin flips, and um, they come out roughly half land on heads, <coughs> half, half land on tails, in a rather unpredictable order, and this is a very quick and simple way of giving you some information about the statistical distribution of, uh, uh, of coin flips or coin flip outcomes, right? But then if you get going to get into the weeds of it and come to, uh, to the metaculus, then all of a sudden, you know, the probability of uh, uh, saying that the probability of a coin flip is one half is not exactly that. Um, it's not just a quick, it's not in the first place, a quick summary of a statistical regularity, but it's a certain measure on microconditions, right? It's basically for one particular event, one particular coin flip, you can compute all the micro trajectories corresponding to the relevant uh, macro state, and some will result in the, head, uh, in the coin end, uh, landing with heads up, and some will result in the coin landing with heads down, and then you have a measure on the initial conditions of the universe, basically. And you can use this measure to compute a precise uh, number for the, the measure of the set of micro trajectories resulting in heads up, respectively heads down. And this is the probability. And then you might wonder, what does this have to do with the statistical regularity that we wanted to summarize? And if it has anything to do with the statistical regularity at all, then the connection is given by some sort of law of large numbers. So some result of the form that the measure of the set of initial conditions, let's say compatible with the past hypothesis or some other relevant macro condition, such as yeah, the relevant frequencies of let's say, heads and tails, this being, this CI being technically a random variable, it just encodes the outcome of the i coin toss depending on the initial condition, right? But, um, it's absolute that this measure give, that this relative frequency deviates significantly from a one half is very small. So very small here would be um, somewhat proportional to this one square. So it's approximately zero for large n. Right. And this being the measure on the past hypothesis macro region or on the possible initial conditions of the universe. Right. So the, the, view, the view that I was expositing wouldn't say that that's a measure, it would say that that's a probability. Right, okay. We can call this a probability, but then at this point, 
the probability, the, uh, the role of this probability measure is to tell us that a certain set of initial conditions, namely the set of initial conditions that would lead to significant deviations from this statistical regularity is very unlikely or has very small measure. Okay. And at this point, it really doesn't matter. So if you look at the standard deviation, or the standard derivation, or standard proof of the textbook version of the law of large number, it would involve here an integral over this random variables with respect to this measure. And it, um, this one half would come out as the expectation value. But uh, at this point, it really doesn't matter where this number came from or whether we thought about it as a probability in the first place. Right? At this point, we have a physical result that the initial conditions that um, make it that the relative frequency in the long series of coin tosses deviates significantly from one half is very, that this measure is very small. Or if you insist on using a probabilistic language at this point, that it has very, long, uh, very low probability. Yeah. Um, but I think that Barry wants to say something more. It's just not a uh, change of terms. I think for Barry, the term probability has some more or different content than just being a measure. Yeah, OK. Yeah, but even at, at, at this point. Yeah, yeah of course, it's related really to by the principal principle. Yeah. Right. So then but you should have high right. confidence. You should have high confidence at this point that the initial conditions will be such that the statistical mm -hmm. regularity obtains. Not any old measure would have that. Sorry? Not any old measure would under under no. write that connection. Not any old measure, no, but very many will have this right. will, will have this uh, feature that this set of initial conditions are very has very small measure. So I think, at the, but so, but the, I think the, con, the confusion here, or what I would disagree with, is um, to give a lot of meaning to this, to this number here, you know, whatever it may be. Um, right, which is the measure of the set of mi micro conditions, the exact measure of the set of micro conditions for which the if point toss whenever and whenever, whenever it might occur, results in head. This particular, this particular number, which in the final result, plays no role anymore in this final result. Right? And I think that at this point, if, uh, God would be mildly annoyed if only, if you thought that the information that he was uh, giving you were contained in this number. It's not. The information that he wanted to give you what he wanted to let, tell you about the statistical regularity in the world is contained in a result like this. And of course, at this point, it doesn't matter because if you know, uh, God is uh, very kind to us, you can derive, you can derive something like this from from that. If you have nice independence properties, all these results are statistically independent or uncorrelated in some sense, because it's just impossibly to prove or verify in any rigorous sense, or usually hope that this is, this is true, then you can derive this law of large number result or prove it from these single case probabilities. But what I think has really uh, physical, what I think has really physical significance is this result. So a statement about um, what happens with very high probability. And with very high probability, if you want, we will have this statistical pattern of regularity. And one way to see that these numbers are not essential, and maybe not meaningful at all, is to realize that this result here would be true for a whole lot of different measures that agree on the smallness of the set but may disagree very significantly on the uh, values, so -called pro the measures of so-called probabilities assigned to this individu uh, individual D outcomes. Dustin? Yes. So at this point, so I, thought, I think that was very well put. And maybe it's worth making up a name yeah. for a view of the following kind. 
which is not exactly the probability view, and I don't know whether or not it's exactly the typicality view, okay? Um, but, but maybe it's worth putting on the table so that we can consider it. The view, the construction of a sort of picture of the world on this view that I'm imagining would go like this. Um, you have a sort of mentaculous structure, but instead of stipulating a single probability distribution over initial conditions, we talk about a set of probability distributions over initial conditions. You want to call them a very broad set or, or something like that, that's fine with me. It doesn't include all mathematically possible initial conditions because there will be plenty on which that's not, on, on which the de desired result does not emerge, okay? Yeah. But you take the set on which the desired result emerges, okay? And then you say, my theory is committed to all and only those claims on which all probability distributions in this set agree, okay? So in that case, there will be no, the theory will not assign any sharp probabilities to all the things that, that you were saying it's crazy or beside the point or not far part of physics to assign definite probabilities to. So imagine a view like that, let's call it the set view, okay? okay. Just, to, ju just to keep track of it. Yeah. And one of the things that it will be interesting to hear about as we go on is whether and in what way the set view is different from the typicality view. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, I don't have an opinion about that. Yeah. Um, I think it will be useful to map the terrain of, of you know, logically possible positions here to sort of put a flag in that and, and keep it in mind and keep that question in mind as we go forward. Right. So, uh, so. Can I, I, mean, I, if you want to answer, yeah. but I, there is something kind of a little bit formal I want to do. Yeah. Because I, I think I can contrast conceptually what's going on between the two sides. I mean, do you yeah. mind if I just do this? No, sure, sure. Just reacting to what Barry said, and when Barry said, it's got to be a probability, it mentioned the principle, principle, and so on. Um, so as, as I conceive of the situation, and then I'll, let, me just, let me just put up my, the two sides as I understand them, and then, and then the other side can object, and, which is fine. This is just the way I see the situation. And I think, I think not seeing this contrast is leading to a lot of failure to communicate. I think what we have here is a failure to communicate. Um, so, the Mentacuris, I'll do, I'll do that because this is my own biology uh, What Conceptually, what's really important for this view, uh, and let me do something else. So we have something, let's call it MPM, stands for a mathematical, probability measure. And I say mathematical because this has nothing to do with what it's a measure of. Right. It's just that it, that it fulfills the mathematical, it is a measure that fulfills the mathematical conditions for a probability measure. It, it's just a measure normalized to one. It's a measure normalized to one. You have a sigma algebra, it assigns you know, real numbers to elements in the sigma algebra in a certain way, blah, 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 blah. Right? And it doesn't have to be a problem. I love to say, take the area, take the normal area measure over the surface of this table, normalize it to one. It's a mathematical probability measure. But intuitively, it has zero to do with probability. Right? If I say, oh, now, randomly choose a point, and you say, well, what do you mean by randomly? Well, I mean where the probability of, of choosing a point in any given measurable set is that measure, then you get a connection to a probability, but all that came in artificially by the randomly choose a point, right? It's, you know, the, the thing is just, it's a size measure. Right? Nothing to do with probability. So we've got some mathematical probability measures floating around. 
in the metaculous view, as I understand it, it's very important that you get something that really is a probability. This is my understanding of what Barry was saying. What does that mean? It means it plugs into the principal principle. Right? That on, on the basis of, of having some belief about what the value of this thing is, that has implications for your credences in non-probabilistic claims, like it will rain today. Yeah? So in the metaculous view, it's very important that you not merely have a mathematical probability measure, but that you have a probability. This, we go through the principal principle, which gets us to subjective expectations. And calculating expected utilities, decision theory, blah, 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 blah. Right? Right. What I haven't understood is there anything semantic going into probabilities before they are uh, put in the principal principle, or are there just numbers in some kind of mathematical no, I, I, I mean, theory? For, again, as I understand it, for Barry, the, the condition for being used in the principal principle it surely goes beyond the mathematical. Sure, of course. Right. That's, right. that's one of the conditions on right. probability measure really such an important one. Lewis actually says it's all he knows right. about. About objective, what do you mean by objective? But I think there's, there's more to it. Very I think that yeah. the physicists say right. about the But it, And it's also on this view, you see why it's very important that this thing, among other features, be a mathematical probability measure. Because it's going to give you credences. And if your credences don't satisfy those conditions, then you can be Dutch book, blah, 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 blah. Right? Yeah. And then you're irrational. Okay? So I, I mean, I just see this as, as a kind of large architecture. There are more details to fill in the large architecture. Yeah? Now, <coughs> typicality, as I understand it, conceptually is not tied to this at all. Right? If you have, if you have one of these gadgets, you can use it over here. But even if you don't have one, you don't need it. Typicality is, as I've said, tied to the simple predicates, big and small. It's more like a volume, you know, a, a, a judgment of size. Judgments of size, just in, you know, in their conceptual nature, have nothing to do with probability. Yeah. And the way you use this here is you've got the space, right? You've got the space of initial conditions. If you have some feature, some property, let's call it P, and you can say of every initial condition, does that lead to a universe with P, like galaxy formation or development of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in gas or something like that, there'll be a well-defined subset of this space that satisfies, let's say, the condition P, if it's a sharp condition. Right, so now, that now we have the set of initial conditions that satisfy P. And we can ask, is that set big, small, medium? Okay. Just those three possibilities. Nowhere here have I put a, 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 even a mathematical probability measure. Okay, I'm just using a predicate, big. What, obviously, what follows from learning that the set is big is not something that's going to plug into the principal principle, because I'm not even, don't, again, I don't even have a probability measure. Okay. How, how does it plug in? So here's this, here's so I, I added this, I put it together with another principle, that you learn this Quirno's principle. Yeah, you can, you, 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 you can do that, OK? But I, I want to suggest something else. And the something else, and this is the kind of thing where, it, we, 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 when we said there's kind of a normative aspect to this, there's an aspect of rationality and, and, and explanation, and when is an explanation done, that is not metaphysics. It's a different subject, a hard subject matter. It's not that I have a lot to say about it, but I have something to say about it in this case. 
So let's suppose I close my eyes. I've not looked at the world yet at all. I am informed somehow, reliably, of the dynamics. Let's say I'm informed about the uh, past hypothesis, for example, as well. Maybe I, I know I'm given some macroscopic information. Without looking at the world at all, I can now, if I have this distinction in hand, I can say, ah, the set of initial conditions that lead to P before I look is P. Question, does that mean I ought to expect P when I open my eyes? That's exactly the question. Yes. Right. My answer is no. OK? Doesn't follow you should expect it. Here, it does follow, right? Because you, if, if, if this thing is large and you use it to set your credences, then you're saying, yes, you ought to expect it. Here, okay, no. That doesn't follow you should expect it. And then you say, well, what good is it? The answer is, if in fact, when you open your eyes, you find P, and I'm not telling you what odds you should put on that, but if in fact, you open, when you open your eyes, you find P, you should be satisfied that P has been explained. Why? Because almost every initial condition, the, the, the set of initial conditions leading to P is big. The set of, of initial conditions not leading to P is small. I so, to, can I say a couple of things? So, what's to be explained? Yeah. Why the initial <laughs> condition is in the big set? Okay. But I should take that as an explanation, even though it, it doesn't go by, well, that's what you should expect. Yes. I would say you should consider your explanatory task finished, and this is in fact what we do, even though I haven't said a word on this side about any mathematical probability measure at all. Now, if you have a let me, let me just, this is the last thing I want to say. If in fact you have a mathematical probability measure floating around somewhere, like the natural measure, of course, you can use that to make this distinction, right? You just say if set is big if by this measure it's almost one, and it's small if by this measure it's almost zero, and it's neither if by this measure it's somewhere in between. So if in fact you have one of these floating around, which is well motivated and seems like the right thing to use, you can use that to make this judgment and then employ this whole gadget. But it's not important. And, and if many, many, many of these, all of which seem kind of pretty natural and well motivated and nothing that seemed hoped up or anything else, give you the very same partition, then even more you're going to say, well, what do I have to do? <coughs> Explanation is over. Don't worry your head about it. Yeah. So, Will the fact that you're satisfied that you've got an explanation of P at all change your expectation about um, what you expect to see later on in the future? I mean, look, of course, once you open your eyes, if you're rational, one thing you're going to use is straight induction. And probably whatever you see, you're going to expect to see more of it. OK, so how do you? So that so that will then, of course, once I see that, in fact, P occurs when I look around, I'll probably expect to see more P when I look in further places. So then but that's normal. That's, right. straight, that's just straight induction. Right, so it seems like built into your idea of explanation is um, some kind of relation between explanation and expectation. Because now well, that, well, then how does the fact I didn't say, I, I don't understand. I, I was very careful not to say that. You're the one who brought in. And so then why is it changing your expectations now that you have an explanation? By straight induction. I gave you that answer. Okay, so straight induction has nothing to do with explanation. If I see the sun rise 100 times in a row, I'm going to expect it to rise, even though I have no explanation about why it rises. If I take aspirin and 100 times in a row my headache goes away, I'm going to expect my headache to go away the next time, even though I can't explain at all how it works. If you were rusty, you can do it. I would. Yeah. Of course. This is not deduction. This is fallible. We all know that. So what? Why, why are you steering so clear 
saying, yes, I expect it. it you don't, you're not going by I'm steering so clear because I want to make a very clear distinction between these architectures. Sure, but and, and, and by not mentioning expectation and not mentioning probability from beginning to end, <coughs> And noticing that this architecture absolutely <coughs> requires expectation and absolutely requires probability, no, you see sharply that this architecture is not this architecture. Sure, okay, but you, you, you haven't got probability measure, you've only got big small. Yeah. Right, but then you have a bigger amount of expectation and a small amount, not the fine brain. I didn't, why are you being, I didn't bring an expectation. I, I know. I kind of, you know, did everything know why I could to say, before you open your eyes, I'm not telling you what to expect. Okay. I, I did everything I could to take expectation out, and you're trying to shove it back in. Why? I, I don't, well. It I was making would, the point that this yeah. isn't about expectation, it's about explanation. Sure. And explanation and expectation are not the same thing. But, so I would at this point is, Controversial even within the typicality community. That's so fine. I mean, there's space is controversial in every community. So I think this is helpful in that, yes, typicality is essentially distinct from probability, and there are typicality facts which are not probability facts, and then there's, I think, a separate discussion about what are the normative implications yeah. of typicality. And, anyway, I want to. Uh -huh. See, other typicality people could put other things on the table. I, this is what I, having had these discussions over many years and trying to figure out the differences, I think this to me was very sharp to see a very clear fundamental difference in what you think you're doing and what you're achieving that comes through. Now, you know, obviously other typicality people can adjust that and metaculous people can do a a David kind of thing and say, oh, let me go from a probability measure to a set of probability measures. Yes. I mean, you know, to me, of course, that's backwards. I say, look, of course, if you give me a typicality measure, which is not in a te technical sense a measure, it's just a predicate, then there's going to be a fact about how many of these gadgets return this. And so there will be a set of mathematical probability measures that you can say are consistent with or, or generate yeah. the very same judgments of typicality. Yeah. So yeah. There, those will be intertranslatable. But they're, but they're intertranslatable because this is what's doing the work. And it's on the basis of this that you're picking the other ones out. It's not because, oh, I have a clear notion of a set of probability measures. And I say, oh, here's a good set of probability measures. Let me now ask what they all have in common. It's just the opposite. I say, this is what I want to recover. Mm -hmm. Which probability measures recover? Yes, yeah, it's also part of what I argue, that there is a pre-theoretic notion of typical, you know, all the measures are supposed yeah. to capture rather than define. So mm -hmm. measure can fail to be a typicality measure, and it doesn't capture uh, the intuitive meaning of typical or of nearly all of big versus small. I just have a really quick question. I mean, I, I don't, I'll mention, but won't get into, I think the characterization of the metaculous stuff was, well, like Dustin diplomatically said, um, um, it's also, it also may be at the very least controversial among metaculous people, whatever those are. Um, but, um, but I just, I, <laughs> but I just, I have a question. I have a question about the uses of things like statistical mechanics on Tim's view. So is it really not the case that we're interested in making, in doing things like making predictions? We're, we're just interested in explaining the second law of thermodynamics or something? I, I never said that. No, I didn't say you did that, that's why I okay. asked. Sure, so we're interested in making predictions too. That's another thing we're interested but in. So, and, 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 and so am I wrong in thinking that predictions and expectations are linked to each other? I'm just trying to get a handle on on where the stuff is. Pred predictions are expectations about the future, so of course those are linked. So okay, so, so, so this you know, does give us... So I'm, Tim, I'm just confused. Again, I'm, I'm saying this, there's a role this plays in explanation. 
Yes. An explanation is not necessarily an expectation. I'm with you. Now I'm asking about the role it plays in expectation. Maybe it doesn't play any role. Ah, so it, it, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But sometimes people do make predictions on typicality grounds. So I, I think it does. I think typicality effects are predictive. Yeah. I mean, so, sometimes, you know, with Shelley might, you know, quick prove her without saying typical the, 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 the initial states of some system, the total rate like this, and I think there's a, a suggestion there, yeah. And we can predict, predict that they do and, and see. You know. I, I think it would be, I think it would take very, very, very sharp diagnostic tools yes. to distinguish someone who says X, I, here's a proof that X is typical. If you find X, your explanation is done. But if you ask me how likely it is it that I find X, I just shrug and say, I don't know. But when you go look, if you find X, your explanation is done. And someone who says, this is typical, now go expect it. I, I, I mean, you would just need a very, very specific situation to distinguish those attributes. But the, the specific, so that's what that, the, that the specific uh, um, situation is scientific experiments. We make a prediction based on a theory and some typicality assumptions. If the, if, if the what actually happens is different from what you expect, you say, okay, there's a... No, no, look, look, look. so let me, let me play it out. Suppose okay. I say, I, I show that something is typical. I don't say, I'm not saying you should expect. Okay. If you open your eyes and find it, your explanation is done. If you open your eyes and don't find it, your explanation isn't done. There must be other phys physical principles at play that you haven't accounted for yet. Now that may look like saying, oh, you refuted that other theory. But of course, by my methodology, I would say, sure, if, if, if you open your eyes and you don't see what you judge to be typical, then, then, then there must be some other physical principles of, at play, and your, your explanatory job is not finished. But if what you see is typical, then your explanatory job is finished. I can say all that without saying you should do <laughs> it. Exactly like that. What we typically would be in equilibrium. I opened my eyes and found that I was. That's right, and that tells you there's another, there has to be another principle at play, which is the past hypothesis. That's exactly right. So I, I, But no, which is the opposite is what I was saying. That if I opened my eyes and found the universe in equilibrium, I would say nothing needs to be explained. It's typical. Yes, if you open your eyes, and of course you wouldn't have eyes and you wouldn't open them. <laughs> but exactly right. If all I gave you were the were the dynamical laws of the universe, nothing else. I think correctly, you would say a typical state of this universe should be thermodynamic equilibrium. Absolutely. Am I saying you should expect that? Again, I'm not telling you what to expect. I'm just saying that would be typical. If you opened your eyes and found that, you'd say, okay, what, what more do I need to explain? I've got the dynamics. This is typical for this dynamics. Of course, what happens is we open our eyes, and we only can open our eyes because we're not the equilibrium. And so you say, hmm, there must be some more physics to be done. And that is the past hypothesis. How do we confirm or disconfirm the theory of physics and mechanics on your view? I said. So if we take, take, take a concrete example, Einstein and Schmolkowski say, well, look, if priming motion is due to molecular agitation of priming particles, you should, ex you should expect um, that the mean square dis displacement is it is proportional to time with a propor pr proportionality that's a function of Avogadro's number. Mm -hmm. And Karen goes and does the experiments, gets a value back to go Avogadro's number from, from those, mm -hmm. and it agrees with Avogadro numbers from, from, from other sources, and everybody says, hey, we think we now know that early motion really is at molecular agitation of the particle. Yes. How how does that that work on your your so we we've got metaphysics. We have the theory of explanation, which I think is subtle and subtle normative and difficult. We have confirmation theory. 
which is yet something else, right? If I take, if I take aspirin 100 times in a row and my headache always goes away, I would say it's well confirmed that aspirin gets rid of headaches and I would expect my next headache to go away even though I don't understand how any of it works. Right, so, so I have no explanation for that expectation. And, and so I, now I'm, this, I'm not claiming that this plays, I don't know what role it plays in the theory of confirmation. If I want to do confirmation theory, I now need to go to a different and more structured architecture and talk about confirmation theory. Not everything is the same thing. I'm here talking about theory of explanation and understanding. And at what point do you say, this theory accounts for all the phenomena I'm aware of? Now, I could ask you the same question. Suppose I say, like Bohmian mechanics, this theory accounts for all the phenomena I'm aware of. How much should I believe in it? How well confirmed is it? I don't know. Maybe there are a hundred other theories that can equally account. I mean, the, 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 there may be subtle connections between explanation and confirmation, but they're subtle and not obvious. So that's why I, I feel like we're just debating a very fine point now when it comes down to the difference between expectation, explanation, confirmation. I, I feel like it's probably not where really the, the main disagreement will be found between prob probability and practicality. Well, this is this here, though, because the, the tentacular side of this wants to get more, or something more different from what Tim gets fed to the county. Uh, to the county. Uh, Tim gets what needs to be explained and what doesn't need to be explained. Whereas the probability side gets what's to be expected and what's not to be expected. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think, so maybe I should. I mean, I think it's very careful. So I think that typical effects are uh, predictive, and maybe in the end there's really not a big difference between expect and if you find it, consider it ex explained. But so um, I think there are, there's a virtue to you know putting different aspects together into a package as you did, but also keeping separate different parts of the debate and the debate. The argument that I was beginning to make is why you should favor typicality even if you're a human person for most separating these other issues, the metaphysical issue, and so on. And so my the argument that I was starting to make is really that this uh, single case probability that the mentacular spits out does not have, that they do not have any physical content or meaning at all. So you can postulate you can postulate the principal principle and decide to live your life according to these numbers, but they just have no uh, physical, they just have no physical meaning or substance. And maybe in the in um, the you know, example of a coin toss, it's not. Uh, you think the same thing about the dynamic? If the probability is in the dynamics, no. <clears throat> I mean, if the, the, there was a stochastic law. Yeah. That I would make a difference between human and non human laws. I think if you are a non human, then they would refer to something like propensity symbol. But if you are a human, then I think the, so the empirical content. Those probabilities you think didn't have content. Did that dynamic probability? The single case probabilities, the stochastic ones, do have content. The claim is that the single case probabilities that occur when the probability that identicals are deterministic don't have content. All right. So that depends. So they, they, they could have, I mean, uh, dynamical probabilities could refer to actual propensities or something in the world, but it's not what a human generally, generally wants, right? No, I wanted to know what your view was about. The idea, I see why you're saying that the uh, single case probability, when it was deterministic and you're a union, you uh, don't have content. I understand why you're saying that, I don't agree with that. But I think that's a problem for you to make it clear what the content is. Okay? And, um, but I just wanted to know then if, since you're making say that, 
I wanted to know why you, what you thought about the probability of that coming from the fantastic dynamics of it. But why, why couldn't he have the same attitude? They get their money yes. through Carnot's principle. Well, because, yes. because Carnot's principle will apply to, to those that aren't close to the world of zero. No, no but, but, but if you go on long, that, that is, that they have meaning only about, you know, long runs of repeats of similar. Right, so those aren't single case probabilities. Right, right, right. He's going to deny that in the single. That was the question I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, I'm your answer. <laughs> But again, no, am I still a pretend human? Or, I mean, there are ways, that, that there are metaphysical ways to give them meaning I see. In, in the case of the stochastic okay. law. But I would say in the end, the, the empirical content of stochastic law is also found in typical evolution. Good. I mean, it tells you that a, a typical respect to the, to, the, uh, to the probability that is part of the stochastic law, a typical evolution. So one of the big issues here like many issues that are engaged in here, mm -hmm. is whether single case probabilities have, have content or not. Yes, but I wouldn't say that. Um, I think you are, you, you are that you just I think you just misrepresented maybe the uh, critique by by an epsilon. So I wouldn't go as far as saying that a priori single case probabilities cannot have any meaning. I, I'm, I'm rather saying that the metacular, so that the system account just fails to give them uh, meaning. Because in the end, the, the, the system um, probability law is supposed to be a systematization of regularities that occur in the world. Right? So that what makes... But, a, it, yeah, but it does give it meaning, because it, if, if nature is fine and it's a unique such system, then it says the world is such a world these are the the, um, the laws that apply, the probabilities that occur in the laws that assign probabilities to individual cases. And those are the, that's the content of those claims. Because it, it gives up that content by, being, by applying to the whole universe that includes the, the frequencies and so on. But it gives content to individual statements. Okay, and many other. It tells you what's the lead. So my worry here is that there are many other measures that have the same physical content and that they predict the very same regularities and global patterns. They are just not the best system. They are just not part of the best so, system. So this is really a different with the Jungian conception of laws because the idea there is that um, there's a very close connection between the probabilities and the laws. And so the simple, it's the, the simple system of nature is fine and there's a unique, simple system, then it's the one that's telling you what the probabilities are. You, you might not like that, you might not agree with that, but that's from the human point of view. That's it's just a stipulation. Well, I don't know. If right, so you have that's one, out. maybe the uniform uh, measure of lambda, and you have another measure lambda prime, right? And they make, uh, they agree on all the, they could, on all the statistical regularities Come on, the global patterns that come on is typical, but they may disagree on the probabilities of, sig of individual events, of singular events, such as, I don't know, Bernie Sanders winning the Democratic Party. Yeah, but they, not, not for many of them, just a few of them, right? Otherwise, well, they could disagree for many of them. And they could disagree okay. significantly yeah. for, for, for many of them. And then what makes this, what makes this law, this measure part of the the law, a human law, is that it is by some standard more simple, maybe because it's more uniform or whatever. But it doesn't make it more accurate in terms of predicting presidential elections. No, but it makes it more lawful. Right, so it's not just accuracy that's being aimed at in the laws. It's accuracy together with a bunch of other things. Unification. Um, so but it's, it's, just an, it's, it's just an article of faith, so to speak. You can postulate that you should uh, live your life by these numbers that this measure spits out. Mm -hmm. and it's just, and it's true that in some sense those are measured that those are numbers that come from physics, but there's no, there's no deeper rationality to it in the sense that um, following the numbers that this measure spits, spits out rather than the numbers that this measure spits out mm -hmm. makes you more successful or a better predictor or anything of that kind. So there's nothing that this measure says about the, about concrete physical facts that is more true or accurate or more predictive than what this measure says. 
I'm, I'm getting a little lost, so I can shut up. So you started out saying you had an argument that a human uh, about these things should only ascribe probabilities to repeated events and not sing singular events. Can you just say what that argument is? What the argument is? Yeah. That so what makes a uh, measure part of the human mass system is that it uh, figures in the best systematization of the world, right? right? So we add a measure because it comes with relatively little cost of simplicity, right? right? But makes makes the system more predictive. In what sense does it make the system more predictive? Because it does predict certain statistical patterns and regularities, such as the thermodynamic regularities, maybe the bond or quantum mechanics, or the fact that you know uh, one half, roughly one half, fair points on heads. Right? But those are all. How does it predict these statistics, robust regularities by being assigning to them a probability very close to one? This is the sense in which a law is, uh, in which such a probability measure is informative about the world. But then, just because you're using this mathematical tool, right, just as a sort of mathematical surplus, you basically get a measure for any measurable set of micro, of micro conditions, right? And the question is, is are these numbers, are these numbers meaningful? Right. So it's the number that this measure assigns to the... Okay, so let me, let me just see if I can yeah. summarize the picture. So um, the Wintectuous people have been talking is that there's one measure that does a good job of systematizing the world. That, that's the best. The best, right? And you're saying, well, there's probably going to be lots of them that, that do just as good at systematizing the, the, the world. Exactly. And those might differ on things like probability of Bernie Sanders. Right, right. So, so, is the, so is the conclusion that a metaculus ought to be a set metaculus as David was suggesting that to say, okay, instead of one probability measure, there's going to be a whole, whole, a whole bunch of them, and the only thing we assign objective probabilities to are the things that those me that all those measures assign pretty much the same thing to. Is that, is that the claim? Well, I feel like, um, I don't know if the expression actually exists in English. In German, you can say it's like a poison compromise, or a poison, a poison offer. Because from a human point of view, uh, taking a, uh, a whole set or equivalence mass of measures is not simpler than just taking the Lebesgue measure, the Newville measure, and saying that's so of classical mechanics, and I, I don't think it's more predictive. It's, it's equal. No, but what if somebody were to say, I mean, to give a really positive argument for this, yeah. and I take it this is your view, yeah. that talking about a single probability distribution mm -hmm. is just making claims that, number one, we have no epistemic right to, and number two, that, that, you don't, that, that aren't even empirically meaningful. Yes. Okay. So, so why? So, you know, you might be able to convince a union of that, or maybe they would be departing in some way from union orthodoxy by by adopting that. But you might you might say, here's an additional desiderata. That this your theory shouldn't go around making claims that it has no epistemic right to. Okay. Um, um, why wouldn't so, so maybe this set picture is an important thing to discuss yeah. because it sounds like when you were asked, okay, what's the deal here? Is your picture just a set picture? Mm -hmm. you, you sort of said, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I mean, I want to hear more what you're actually saying here. It looks like you're saying, I'm not sure how to differentiate it, but I don't like calling it that. Or, or something like that. Or I suspect that this is a poison gift. Yeah. Um, um, so say more about it. Yeah, I'd like to hear more because, I mean, I've always thought that if one were to be a, a mentaculus, one ought to be a set mentaculus. And that, yeah. given David grief about talking about a single measure you know, for, for many, many year, 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 years now. So it, it, it doesn't strike me as a poison gift, gift for them. On the other hand, if, 
yeah. a better answer, but very briefly, yeah. why don't you just use the Liouville measure because it's nice and simple. Just keep in mind that all these individual numbers are, don't have any normative implication. Just use the Liouville measure, but just keep in mind that it's supposed to be a typicality measure, not what you would call it, probability measure. Good. I, I mean, if that's, if what I'm supposed to be keeping in mind is that any of these measures would do just as well. And that, and that I shouldn't be seeing myself as committed. I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking me to keep in mind. I, I think, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what. I don't see anything objectionable about this proposal. Um, but, but, but maybe you do, and that, that's what I'm trying to see. If you're, if, it sounds like what you're asking me to keep in mind when I use the local measure is there are lots of other measures which would be just as good, yeah. okay? And the only things I really believe, even though in some sense using the yeah. Louisville measure, are the things on which all these measures agree. But the Louisville measure is just a mathematical gadget, a convenient one, and I'm just saying, but that, that's not a gadget, it's a typicality measure. But that's not how it's being viewed too. By, by the it's union of the capital laws. It's not just, I mean, of course there are measures that are more accurate, than the Louisville measure, namely the measure which tells you gives exactly um, which which uh, tells you exactly what the, the initial state. condition is. Yeah. Right. So it's the idea is that to understand the notion of law as some sort of a balancing of various kinds of criteria, and so it's not the case that at least from the union perspective that there's no there's no content to the probability claims. There is content because they're the entailments of the best systematization. Um, and it's not that we don't have epistemic access to them. We do have epistemic access because we have proposals for what the best theory might be. And given these different proposals, we can test them. But there's, yeah. Can I try? I, I have just a first a very specific question. And I, I, I think I understand what Justin's trying to say. I'm going to try and say it in slightly different words. Mm -hmm. The first question is, the set mentaculous person, can you please articulate the conditions for being a member of the set? Just tell me what they are. How, how do I decide what goes into the set? That's very hard. I'm not a member of that set. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's the empty set, and then maybe we're arguing against the position nobody wants. The ones that for, 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 but let, I don't know, let me just finish the number. Sure. Uh, as I understood what Dustin was saying, I, 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 I understand exactly what he said. He said, look, if I, if I were somebody who said, I just care about simplicity and informativeness, why not say, Louisville measure wins on simplicity, because I already have to have the conceptual resources around it in terms of spatial measures and temporal measures to define it, and it's very easy to define them. Unlike the very fancy one you wanted that nails everything down. Right? It's literally simple to define in conceptual, with using a conceptual apparatus that's already there. And the way to use it is not the one on the top, right? To plug it into the principal principle. The way to use it is to figure out according to it what is typical and expect what is typical, and what is atypical, and don't expect what is typical, and the stuff in between. Well, that's the alternative view. Yeah. yeah. But, but what's, I mean, I, I understood Dustin's question being, as a Hulian, why don't you do that? You have now something simple and informative. You just make a distinction between what it's informing you about and what it's not informing you about. Right. So I'm feeling like trying to put me, to offer me this, this set view is just trying to to, uh, to, to, to make me commit to something that seems unnecessarily ugly and contrived. No, no, uh, so it really wasn't. Here, here's the question. Um, um, I, I, well, let me, let me see. I guess. Um, Maybe a very quick way to 
particularly in my and Tim's offer, is just take the Mentaculus with the view of the measurement and the past hypothesis, just combine it with the most principle rather than the principle of those So do take the view of the measurement, it's fine, but the role of this measure is really to make typicality judgments. Uh -huh. And then I see. the Good. union position is even, is even nice because can you even give a justification of this Kono principle, expect what is typical? Why should we expect what is typical? Well, because this is how the probability law is informative by giving probability. You mean thought it's going to get more out of that. It's going to guess Sorry, but that here's what your queen should be. In, um, there are queens that are trying to match the objective probabilities. So there's the objective probability of, I don't know, the radiant atom decay in the next. 10 minutes is 0.7. So my credence should be 0.7. Um, people will get that out of the nose principle. No, but I. That's a feature, though. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, right. <laughs> There's two, two sides of it. Right. So I. Yeah, yeah so, so my claim is on the one hand that um, these human chances that you, you get out of the standard mentalities, you can postulate that you should assign your credences accordingly. I, I don't see any value. I don't see any value in that because I don't think that there's physical content to these numbers. On the so, other hand, I think that again in the typicality of US Tim said multiple times, probabilities come out, objective probabilities come out as typical frequencies. And then you have to do uh, more work to um, get from these typical frequencies to rational credences, but I think it can be done. I mean, in the coin toss case, it's quite simple to, to uh, argue, well, if typically the relative frequency in the long series is one half, one half, why should you assign your credences um, accordingly? In other cases, there might be more, more work to be done to get from typicality facts to rational credences, uh, but I think it is, I think it is possible in all relevant Good. cases. So this is, so I understand this and I think it's really helpful. It sounds like the state of play now mm -hmm. is they still have the question, okay, where did we get the, uh, where did we get the Louisville measure? Mm -hmm. Okay, and it sounds like there are three answers on the table. Mm -hmm. Answer one, we got it from the dynamics, okay? Answer two, it has nothing to do with the dynamics. I mean, of course, we need the dynamics in order to get it, but it's a separate empirical claim. Um, just like the law of gravitation is a separate empirical claim from F equals MA, okay? And then the third view, which I take it is yours, is it somewhere in between there? There's a spectrum. Is that is that right? So, so I mean, if, if the if the mentaculous guy were to adopt this suggestion, which I don't think is a bad suggestion by any means, that would eliminate a certain set of differences between the mentaculous people and the uh, uh, and the typicality people. Um, it sounds like there would still be a difference about this, about where the about where we got the uh, the Louisville measure from. Mm -hmm. Good. So, Good. so I understand you completely. Right. Can you repeat the third option for the Louisville measure? I understood the first one. Can you repeat the third one? Yeah, the third one is a bit <laughs> it's a bit vague. It's not quite uh, it's not quite deductively that the right measure follows from the dynamics. But as we discussed uh, this morning, stationarity is a uh, very reasonable desideratum, which puts constraints on uh, the set of measures in this case. It's simple and it does what you want. Yeah. So the simplicity, as I say, is because it's defined in terms of measures you already have running around. They're empirical measures. No, but what do you mean it does what you want? It does what you want in terms of empirical prediction. Yeah. yeah. Good. Just, like, yeah. just like the law of gravitation. <laughs> okay, uh, but I, I'm not... What, I, I think, yeah, well, well, there's I, a little more to it than just it's, si than just it's simple and empirically successful, right? Otherwise, so here's what I think is, is, is disappointing yeah. from the, a certain Mentaculous point of view. Uh, I think that there's at least a hope 
of using the probabilities that you get out of the calculus account. The probability is different from those close to zero and close to one in accounts of causation and counterfactuals. Yeah, I know. Yes. And if, in fact, that could be worked out, hmm. then you would be losing a lot if you ended up being committed to do what's the meaning of this, or the view that David, because David set the views. Yes. Or you might. I mean, it depends on that, how you know, the account works. Yes. I don't completely agree with that. That's part of what makes it appealing. But that means if, if the standard mentalist view is not convincing, then this yeah. account so for your question is, the, the certain mentalist person, or people, or whatever, got too excited that they were given something. Yes. Or like, like in Christmas, you open up this kind of this trick or trade set. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> and I do think that that's the situation that I'm in, actually. Um, but I don't think you've convinced me to, um, yeah. to give up on the program. We, we, I, I, but but it, it, it is a perfectly reasonable thing. I'm not asking you to do it right now. At some point, to sketch out what these connections are between single case probability sure, and causation. I, so I agree. They're not obvious. Right. Right. Well, well, on the face they're, of it, they're not obvious. There are, there are, there are oh. stabs that accounts for causation in terms of probably, which correlations are probabilistic and which aren't. Those will need probabilities that are different from 0 and 1. Um, I don't know of any account which seems to be quite right. But this is a simple one. This guy of Wisconsin has a um, sober, not sober, this other guy who's there. But it's basically that um, that that when <clears throat> you know, if I say it, it would be easy to think of counter counterexamples. But the, the basic idea starts with is the idea is to remove common causes because so you want to get rid of the correlations. <laughs> So that the things that kind of causes up, although they're correlated, those correlations don't count and as the causal ones. And here's a proposal, proposal for how to do that. I think I could state it, but I don't think I'm going to try it. So, right. so, uh, so, yeah. and, then, and, and it's also an interesting project to see how much of that can be translated into probabilities as typical frequency. Well, what I think was really clarified for me in the discussion was Tim's making the point that what the typicality approach is doing is just, in the end, telling you what needs to be explained. When you need an explanation, when you don't need an explanation. It's certainly the biggest part of it, yeah. When, when, you, when you do need or when you have an explanation the same? Well, both the same. Okay. Yeah. Right, so you, you need one if something, if you don't have something that's untypical. Right. Something, and when you observe something that's untypical, you <laughs> right. to the right thing. Right. Right. Okay. And then maybe this third option that remains a bit vague about where the measure comes from is to say that the choice of the measure already has a certain normative character, right? The, the, the choice of the measure has to be compelling and natural so that it can play this explanatory role. Yeah, I can see that that's not exactly an empirical play. Yeah. And um, it sort of tells you um, how the dynamics is going to explain what, what the dynamics will end up to explain and what doesn't need to be explained. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yes, I right. So I can see, so where I was puzzled when we talked earlier about what room there was between either being implied from, by the dynamics right. or being a separate empirical assumption, right. um, I see now. Um, right, that was why I always thought that was a false type on me. And then, no, I, I yeah, saw that and yeah, I was yeah. saying, Tim thinks that that's a full side line. Yeah. But I didn't see how to, how to get out of the alternative point. Yes. I think you presented it so that I see as an alternative so, But you find it so funny when I wrote that a typicality measure operates to some extent in the space of reason. It sounds too fancy. Yeah, yeah because, because people who use that phrase yeah. I don't like it, but. <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's put some flesh on that by saying it operates and telling us what we need explanations and what we need explanations. Okay, yeah, which will go along with why we have dynamic laws in the first place. Yeah, okay, I see here yeah, all this stuff. Yeah. But the, that was the point that it has already a normative character. It's part of it, from the typicality measure figures in a way of reasoning which has a normative character. I would say, yeah. And the 
this makes it not for me being this a priority empirical So this it seems like we made some progress in yes, the yes. sorting out. I mean, no, noises have been made that suggest progress has been achieved. <laughs> right. <laughs> But we're, we're, there's always made. regression to the mean. Is that how you sum the voices of the day when it said you were like flying? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So the quiet thing is that, and I should explain for, for the others, that one way in which I try to flesh out this way in which the uh, typicality measure is not quite a priori, but somehow epistemically more robust. The dynamic or loss, in the sense that if we observe a phenomenon right, that comes out as atypical, it doesn't seem reasonable to change the typicality measure to change what we mean by typical, but what we usually would do is to reject the dynamical hypothesis. And I kind of like this idea of belief holism that in the end it's always our theory as the belief system as a whole that is challenged by empirical, empirical evidence. But quite had this picture of a web of belief where just some, uh, yeah, some parts of the belief system are just close to the center. He's got a lot of flies when he's <laughs> expecting philosophers. Yeah. When, right. when we change things, yeah. we not just change the dynamics, we change the theory completely or in a dramatic way by increasing the number of variables, for instance, increasing substantially the number of variables. When we discover, for instance, that parity was violated in the particle physics, we said, well, there must be a new force, that neutral forces must be at the two types. One is a violated parity, one is a not violated parity. And once you increase the number of variables, of course, your measure is going to change. Yeah, but there's like, I mean, this is a separate debate about whether there really are these these paradigm shifts, but there is also a certain principle of conservatism that you treat as little as possible. Uh, and there are some parts of your theory that you would tweak before uh, before others, right? Well, you, may, you may remain, you may keep many parts fixed that are working fine. But when climate comes said if you change your theory by using the number of variables, then you have no choice but to change the measure. Because yeah, 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 but that's also different measures can express the same notion of typicality. Right. You change have to change for technical reasons. Right. The mathematical measure, but it doesn't mean that you change the meaning of typical notion of typicality. Right. So, uh, there's one comment I just feel obliged to make because I, you know when one is not careful, and I don't think I've been careful about this in the discussion. Yeah. It's very easy to state the methodological principle the way. Dustin just did, and maybe I did. Gee, if you see something atypical, then you know you've got more explanatory. That, of course, is also oversimplifying. Sure. Because you know, if I if, if I'm looking at the string of a, a, a string of digits that are coming out of I don't know radioactive decays, and there it goes 3.14159 blah blah blah. You know, far enough along, I'm going to say, "Holy, you know, that's you know, I that needs explanation." But of course, any string, any particular string, will be atypical. So I can't say whenever I see an atypical result, I adjust the theory. There's already another judgment about the kind of phenomena that require explanation. And, and this, again, I don't think metaphysics will tell you this. Right. But that's and I don't think logic, logic will tell you this. It's a that because of what, what we think of are other theories that are in the ballpark and capable. So I, I, I don't think it's like that either. I, 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 I mean, there are judgments about what counts as a pattern. Or I, I mean, I think I, I don't know all of the components that go into making the judgment this is the kind of phenomenon that I think there ought to be an explanation for. Uh, and, this, and this is the kind of phenomenon that I'll just write off to coincidence and shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, that was kind of funny, Maybe like Bode's Law or something like that. You know, sometimes you shrug your shoulders and you say, yeah, looked like there was a pattern there, but yeah, just chance, right? There is no explanation. 
And sometimes you say, no, no, you just can't do that, right? You know, this, this is too robust or this is right. too something. And you can't just shrug your shoulders and say, eh, it can be something, right? And it, it's not a place where there are sharp lines and there are probably all kinds of different considerations that, again, are in the realm of reason and not in the realm of metaphysics and not in the realm of logic, right? And things will get, you know, I'm, you, you can do a better, some job of articulating some general principles, but probably nothing very sharp is even yeah. possible. But this, I think within the typicality view, this is one of the hardest problems to yeah, articulate yeah. what other kind of properties with respect to which a typicality seems acceptable. Accept right. Which are not, yeah. I find very um, helpful just uh, one of my favorite uh, examples is just a double slit experiment, right? You know, uh, fame and famously when he discusses the double slit experiment, he prefaces it by saying that here comes something that is completely impossible to understand and less than. And of course, it's, it's not true. We can just assume that Newtonian mechanics is true, but that the initial conditions are so, so special that whenever you shoot particles through a double slit, it forms this interference pattern. It's not physically impossible. It's just, uh, it's just atypical. But I think no one has ever or would have ever entertained the idea of changing the notion of typicality to maybe give a, a Newtonian account of the double slit experiment. There's clearly one sense. People have even some people, which I think is misguided, but just as a matter of fact, more people have entertained the possibility of changing the rules of logic before just <laughs> picking a very weird or contrived or special or, you know, notion of typicality. Well, they probably didn't know that they could. I think they knew. Right? They could account for it. <laughs> I think they knew. So this is just a sense in which I think typicality uh, judgments are more robust and more a priori, if you allow them, this way of speaking, and less empirical than dynamical judgments. And they, they have to be, because otherwise we would basically lose all means to test uh, dynamical theories against empirical evidence, because a theory cannot do worse than make a robust phenomenon atypical in general. Okay, I guess. Thank you.